Hey everyone, this is Luca. I'm really excited to tell you that my course on the basics of R for ecologists is up and running. So if you're an ecologist and you're just getting started with R and feeling that frustration of the learning curve and just need something that can take you by the hand to really understand the solid fundamentals of using R for ecology, check out my course. Just go to r4ecology.com. There's a link also down below and uh, hope to see you there. Hey everyone, it's Luca here. I want to do a really quick video showing you the essentials of R for Ecology cheat sheet, going through each one of the functions on that cheat sheet, which altogether probably comprise about 80% of every function you'll ever need to use in R as an ecologist or biologist more generally. So let's get started. First, we're just going to create some data really quick that we can use for demonstrating all of these functions. And there we have it. So here we have a little bit of data that we can use to understand how these functions work. So don't worry, I'm gonna include all of this code down in the comments below. Um, or in the, in the blog post that I'm gonna be posting with this video. So you can just copy and paste this into the start of your code. All right, now let's get to it. So the first function is probably the most common function you'll ever need to know in R, and that is the concatenate function, or just C function for short. And this is for creating vectors. So as we did above here with number vector, and so when we run number vector, we get these values, and we can also create a vector using character variables. So here we have SPP1 or species one, species three, species two, and species three. And when we created this and run species vector, we have this vector of character values. Okay, next we have sum. So with sum, that simply adds up all the different numbers in a vector together. So if we do sum numvec and run that, we get 20 because three plus six plus three plus eight is 20. If we have an NA in these data, so let's say we had a vector inside here that contains everything in numvec, but then also an NA value or a missing value, you'll actually get an NA because by definition, NA means you don't know what that value is. So because you don't know what one of these values is, you cannot actually calculate the sum of all of these and you get an NA. However, you can add in an argument na.remove or na.rm equals true. And when we run this, it ignores that na and sums everything else together. Next, we have length. This simply tells you either the length of a vector or the number of columns in a data frame. So for if we do numvec in here, we get four because there are four elements in that vector. If we look at this data frame here that we created, let's just take a look at it running that, we have one column of numvec, one column of species vec, and this is the whole data frame together. Now, if we run length for the data frame, we get just the number of columns, in this case, two columns. All right, moving on, unique. Unique tells us how many unique elements there are within a vector. So for example, if we put in number vec or numvec, we have a three, we have a six, and we have an eight. And the reason we don't have four values here is because the three repeats itself twice. Sometimes you want to know what the total number of unique values within a vector are. And a simple way to do that, let's say we want to know how many unique species there are inside species vec. So let's put species vec in here. And when we run that, we get these unique species IDs. But let's say we had a really long list and we can't just count that it's three, we can actually use the length function around the unique function. And now we can find out that there are three unique different types of species inside species vec. All right, next, as.numeric. This is useful because sometimes when you load data into R, for whatever reason, it turns a, what should be a number vector into, or a numeric vector into a character vector. So let's say, for example, we had, we had a character vector, actually it was supposed to be a number vector, but actually, it somehow loaded into R as. And the reason this can happen is because, I'll show you another example. 
let's say these are all numeric. But then somewhere in your data, your field assistant entered in the letter O instead of the number zero. And so when you upload these data and take a look at Charvec, it actually turns all of these numbers into characters, including that original O. So if we use as.numeric, put that in there, we'll get this warning message that says NA is introduced by coercion. And that's because that O isn't actually a real number. Uh, in fact, it's not a fake number either. It's not a number. So we are left with these numbers here, 35215 and an NA value for where that O used to be. Next, we have the log function. I'm not going to give a full example of using the log function here simply because we don't have a lot of data for this quick demonstration. But simply put, this extracts the natural logarithm of a value or of the values in a vector. So if we put in here, let's just say the number three and run that. This is the natural log of three, 1.098612. If we have a vector of values here, numvec, it calculates the logarithm of all of these numbers. And this is useful usually when you're visualizing or plotting data that's uh, skewed to one side and you want to be able to visualize it a little bit nicer. I find myself using the log function quite a bit. And then you just have to indicate on one of your axes that the data are log transformed. Next, we have the sort function. This is used to ar arrange a vector numerically or alphabetically. So if we have our numvec here and run that, It'll rearrange all the values in numvec, starting with the lowest, going up to the highest. Or if we do use our species vector, it will organize them alphabetically. And actually, it also organized them numerically because SPP is the same for all of these values, but the one, two, three, and three uh, was used for rearranging these values. But if let's say we had a bunch of different letters, D, S, and A. If we run sort, whoops, we actually need to make that into a vector. There we go. Try that again. It has rearranged them with A starting first, then D, and then S. We can also reverse that order by saying, so if we if we ran sort on numvec, we get 3368, and we can add in this argument decreasing equals true, and now the values will be decreasing starting with 8, 6, 3, and 3. Next, we have this is.na function. Is.na is super useful, use it almost all the time because we're always encountering values that might be uh, na or missing. Essentially what this does is it tells us is a value an na or not. So if we add in a vector here, let's make up, let's make up a vector, one, two, three, five. There was no two, it's just one, three, five, na run that, we get false, 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 and true because one, three, and five are not NA, but NA is NA, so we get a true there. The reason this is useful is normally for most other values we could say, let's say we want to find out, actually let's create this as a new vector, we'll call it new vec, And let's say we want to see which of these values is greater than two. So we'll say new vec is greater than two. And we get a false, true, true, and NA because we don't know what that value is. The three and five are greater than two. The one is less than two, so we get false. Let's say we want to see which values are equal to three. We get false, and then we get true for the three, false, and then NA. That makes sense. But now let's see if we want to find out which values are NA. So we put equals NA. Ah, but look, we get four NAs. That's because NA means we don't know what it is. So you can't actually say NUVEC equals NA because that's like saying NUVEC equals I don't know what. So that's what we use this is.NA for. That's useful if you want to identify which values are NA and want to remove them from your data set. Oftentimes I'll use is.na with an exclamation point in front of it, which actually makes it not. So rather than giving you false, 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 true, it reverses those by applying this not statement. 
And when you run that, you get true, 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 false. So sometimes, for example, if you want to remove NAs from a data set, you can use this and index your data using this. So let's, we'll, we'll actually use NuVec here instead of that to make it a little simpler to see. If we index NuVec with this true, 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 false, we are left with just one, three, and five and successfully remove that NA value from our data. All right, next we have the in percent in percent operator, whatever that's called. Not technically a function, but super, super useful nonetheless. Uh, used for finding what items match between two vectors. Usually used for matching character values between two vectors, but can be used for numbers as well. Let me show you how this works. Let's use the example from the cheat sheet. Species vec in, and let's create this new vector species one and species four. So what this does is it says, here we've got species vector, we've got this vector, four different well, three different species, but four different elements. And then we have this other vector of these two individuals here. And what this says is within species vec, which of these values are also found inside this vector? So when we run this, we get true, false, false, false. When we look at what species vector is, species, the first value is species one, which is found in this vector, so that's true. And species three, species two, and species three are not found inside this vector. So we get false, false, false for each of those. Now, if we reverse this, and run that, we get true and false because again, species one is found inside species vec, but species four is not. So remember that whatever goes before the percent in percent is the vector for which you're going to get trues and falses to see whether these elements also occur in this vector. So next we have a really cool set of functions for parsing date values. Up until now, we've been using the base package, which comes installed with R. We don't have to load any new packages, but for this next function, we're going to load the lubridate package. If it's not installed already, use install.packages lubridate. I have it installed already, so I'm not going to run that. So I'm just going to run library lubridate to load that package. So what lubridate gives us is this really cool set of functions that we can create using a Y, an M, and a D. Y stands for year, M stands for month, D stands for day. So we can create a function Y month day, we can say day month year, we can say year day month. You get the idea. You can do any combination of these three. And so you want to order the year, day, and month based on the date that you are trying to parse. So let's say we have Let's say we somehow entered in our field data the dates as, let's say, 2016 slash June comma 13. Now, if this is just a character value, nothing special, no date object here. But let's say all of our data are in this format and you're going, geez, how am I going to make R know that these are actually date values and not some weird format that I decided to use? Well, we'll use this function here, in this case, y for year first, month comes next, day comes last, make sure this order is the same as the order of values in here, and we run it and voila, we now have a date object where R knows that this is a date and we can tell that because it's transformed this format into this nice standard date format in R. We can also save this as an object, my date, and take a look at that if you run the function class and then put my date inside there, we can see that it is now a date object. So what's really cool about these functions is it will take just about any type of date formatting you can think of. So let's say another example from the cheat sheet is 13th of June 2016. 
In this case, we'll say day, month, and year. Run that, and we get that same date object. Next, we have a few cool functions for creating vectors. We have the sequence function, seq, and it's used to create a vector of values that increment at a regular rate. So for example, we could say, takes a few arguments, so from, to, and by. So from, let's say we want to go from zero to 10, and we want to go by twos. And when we run that, we get the value 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. If we had put in 0 0.5 here, it would also start at 0 and go to 10, but in increments of 0 0.5. Then we have the function rep or repeat. And this is used to create a vector with a repeating set of values. So we could say the first argument is called x. We'll say x is all the values from 1 to 3. So remember, if you just look at that, it's just 1, 2, and 3. And so we'll repeat that times equals 2. So that will take this pattern here, repeat it twice. So now we get a vector that goes 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. If instead of times, however, we say each equals 2, it will take each individual element of this vector, repeat it, and then go on to the next element. So now we have one, one, two, two, three, three. And finally, to complete the basic functions, I'm gonna go over one of my favorite functions, which is the grepl function, G-R-E-P-L. And this is used for finding which elements of a character vector contain a particular string of text. So for example, we could say, let's say, so the first argument is the pattern we're searching for. So let's say we're searching for anything that contains this number three in the character string. And we'll search within the vector of species vec. So let's take a look at that. Look at species vec again. We have species one, species three, species two, species three. Species 3 and species 3 each contain that value of 3 inside it, so we get a return back that goes false, true, false, true. If, for example, we had said SP, P, now, or maybe just SP, which of these contain that string of text? We'll get true for everything, of course, and so on. So a common way that I use the grepl function is for subsetting data frames or vectors. So, for example, we could say, if we look at data frame, this is the data frame we created before, it has a column of numvec and species vec. And if we want to subset this, let's say grepl, let's say we want to extract all of species three or all the species that contain, the species names that contain the value of three, we'll say three here, just like we did before. And then, data frame, we'll use, we could have just put in species vec on its own, but since we're subsetting this data frame, it's better practice to include a reference to the column within the data frame that we're filtering by. So again, if we just take a look at this part, run that, we get false, true, false, true, true for species three and species three. And to filter this data frame, we also add a comma here because these are all of the rows we want to keep, and we're gonna apply this to all the columns. Uh, and there it is. Now we have filtered this data frame down to just species three. So that's it for the basic functions. Now let's continue on with loading data. I don't have any data sets to load for this quick tutorial, but I will just quickly show you how these functions work. Read.csv. All you have to do is put in the path for the data set you're trying to load. So actually, to make this work and a little bit nicer for you, let's actually reverse those functions. Let's use write.csv to save our special data frame that we created here and then reload it in using read.csv. So we'll just save that as data frame.csv. And the first argument of the write.csv is the actual data frame. In this case, we called it data frame. And it will save right in the base directory where we are working. So to get a look at that, let's go on ahead to actually another function, the 
get working directory or g e t w d this will show us where our base working directory is located here in my case it's located in this users luca negoida documents entrepreneurship grad ecologist youtube r tutorials folder which is actually this folder right here let's say we want to save it inside this folder here, which is tutorial scripts. So I'm just going to add in here, tutorial scripts slash dataframe.csv, and it will save right in here. There it is. All right, so now let's use this read.csv to load it back in. We have to use the same file path location and We'll save it into a new file. Let's call it data frame uploaded. Now let's take a look at data frame uploaded. And there it is. Now, interestingly, it added this extra column of one, two, three, four. And that's just because when you use write.csv, it helps to add in row.names equals false because for some reason, write.csv likes to add in these row names whenever you're saving a data frame. So if we run that again, and now load this data frame one more time and take a look, now we have only those original two columns that we had before. Great. Now, we have this other function we haven't talked about, set working directory. This is to set where the working directory is going to be. In this case, we used get working directory to see where it was. And if we wanted to change where the working directory is, we could use that. However, I include it here to make a point. It's a really important and good idea not to ever use set working directory. Instead, go to file, new project, and create, oh, let's save that, okay. New directory or existing directory, new project, directory name, create that project, and then start creating scripts in there. You can see here, I have a project called YouTube R Tutorials. The great thing about using RStudio projects is that it creates that base directory right where the YouTube R Tutorials project file is based. So if we go back one folder and scroll down here, you'll see I have this YouTube R Tutorials R proj file, and that's automatically created when you create a new project in R. The nice thing about this is now if I take this entire folder with the R project in it and email it to you, share it with a friend, send it wherever I wanna send it, and you run this same script, you will also be able to load up these data from this tutorial scripts folder because the base directory, this part when you use get working directory, this part of it of everything will change depending on your computer and where you save this project. But YouTube R tutorials, that base directory will always be the same and relative to whoever is using that project. So my spiel is done. Don't use set working directory, use R project files and let's go on from there. Next, let's create some custom functions. So up until now, we've been using functions that are already created and built in with R or other packages that contain these functions, but sometimes you just need to create that perfect function that fits your job exactly as you need to do it, and there's just nothing else out there. So here we go. So to create a function, you use the function function. Let's name this function my funk. And by the way, if you hear something that sounds like a dying dog outside, that is actually a sea lion that's not dying, that's actually quite happy and roaming around in the water, defending its territory. Uh, just wanted to alleviate any anxiety that that sound might be giving you. Um, I'm based in the Galapagos, very fortunately so. And so there are random wildlife sounds that will fill this tutorial as well. Just a heads up there. Okay, now back to the my function. I'm calling it my func, and into that we're putting this function function. The arguments of the function function are whatever arguments you want your function to take in. So we'll just call, the simplest way to do it is we'll just call it x. We could have called it whatever we wanted. 
So our function will take in one value that's called x or one variable that's called x. And then you use these curly brackets to enter the contents of the function. Let's say we want a function that will modify the value of x in this weird way. So we'll create this variable x mod and to modify, to create x mod, we're gonna take x, add five to it, and then take the result of that and multiply it by three. There's one more thing we have to add to this function and that is a return function. This function tells R what aspect of the inside of this function to actually return or output to the user. In this case, we're going to say xmod. So looking through this, we've got this function function where it will take this value of x and then it will take that value of x, x add five, multiply that whole thing by three, save that as xmod, and then the function returns the contents of xmod. So if we run this, nothing happens, but the function is now saved here in our environment under the functions category. And so to run this function, all we have to do is use my func, and now we can use parentheses with it, just like you would with any other function, and the first argument that it takes, the only argument that it takes is x, and that let's just put in numvec, and there it is. Looking at numvec again, it takes each of these values. So for example, three, three plus five is eight, times three is 24, six plus five is 11, times three is 33, and so on. And it returns all those values. And of course, because this was the only value in the function, we could have also just ignored that x equals and just written it like that, and we would get the same result. Okay, now let's move on to a few miscellaneous functions. Actually, two of those functions we've already gone over up here, the install.packages function that we use for installing any new packages that our computer does not currently have installed. But once they are installed, you do not need to install them again. You only need to use the library function to load up those packages whenever you have a new R session. I'm going to delete this because this error right here. Actually, I'm gonna comment it out. There we go. All right, so that's what the library function does. You always need to load it, load a new package into your R working space, into your new session, as it's called, uh, whenever you are working with it again. If I reloaded R and didn't run this, I would get an error if I tried to run these functions because it doesn't know where they are. You can think of it as installing that install that packages is you going to Home Depot and buying a bunch of new, really cool, fancy tools. And then library is you going into your shop and pulling out those tools and getting them ready to use. Okay, there's a few other miscellaneous functions here that are useful. There is the help function. If you ever don't know what a function does, just use the help function on that function. So let's say we want to know what grepl does. All we have to do is help grepl run that and it will automatically open this little help window here to the right where we can see all about grep and grepl and all these other functions that are related and what they do and how they work, the different arguments in them. And then the best part that I usually scroll down to immediately when I really wanna figure out how a function works is the examples section where you can see concrete examples in R for how the particular functions work and you can just copy and paste them right into here and see what happens. Another way to access this help database here is simply to go to help in this panel here, type in the function you're looking for, hit enter, and it will come up on here. And then you can search within this page just by clicking here. Let's say we want to look up just grepl, not, not grep or anything else. We got it there. You can keep scrolling through and see all the times that that word occurs in this help file. Then we have the data function. This is fun because we can access a whole bunch of built-in data sets for playing around and experimenting in R as we are learning. If we run the data function with empty parentheses, nothing in it, we get this list of all these different data sets with a short little description of what they are. Let's say we want to look at a data set on the survival of passengers on the Titanic. Woo. Okay. So notice that the data set's called Titanic with a capital T. We can go here and type in Titanic and run that. 
And now if we look at our environment, we have this new data set here, Titanic, and then the values, for some reason it says promise here. I have no idea what that means. I guess R is promising that they're gonna give us the data. Uh, I don't know what that means. Either way, you just click on it and it's right there. Um, or or if, we, if we had run it, um, then you could save it as its own file, my Titanic data. Doing that also turns it from saying promise here to actually an actual data set. So if we take a look at, um, oh, I guess it's a, it's like a weird, this, this isn't a good data set example, but the point is, cause it has all these different uh, components to it. But anyway, the point is that you run this data function with the name of the data set and you can extract those data. You'll notice up here, that's what I did with trees data. So I ran data trees, saved trees as its own data frame called trees data. And that's this right here. And then I did a few modifications to add a few columns to it. Uh, I added this column of light and then used these functions that I already went over rep and C to create this vector of sun and shade treatments. Let me run just that can see it creates this vector of sun and shade, and we're just adding that into the tree data set and then making sun and, and shade into a factor using as dot factor. So if we take a look at tree data now, it's the same as before, and we also have this extra column of shade and sun values. You can also learn more about the data that you've, that you've loaded in using the data function by searching by using the help function. So we'll put Titanic, or actually let's put trees, that's more ecological than Titanic data. We'll put trees into the help function and here we have this really nice explanation for this trees data set, which explains what these different columns mean, how they were measured, any sources or references for where these data came from and a few examples of playing around with these data. All right, so that's it for the miscellaneous functions and that's it for side one of the essential functions of our cheat sheet. If you like this video so far and want to finally feel confident with visualizing and managing your own data in R as an ecologist, then be sure to check out my online course on the basics of R for Ecologists. The course is completely self-paced and I take you by the hand through all the essentials of R using ecological data sets as well as exercises to test your learning along the way. The course is also fully accessible to everyone regardless of financial ability. So just click below to learn more and sign up for the upcoming enrollment period. Okay, now let's get on to some basic data visualization. The most common and basic function that you'll ever wanna use for plotting your data in R is just called plot. It's great for creating scatter plots as well as box plots, as well as a few other things, but I'm gonna limit the conversation to that because those are probably the most common plots you'll ever need to create. So let's use our tree data for this. So the plot function takes an argument data equals tree data. Remember, we were just taking a look at that data set just before. Let's take a look at it one more time so I can just show you what those variables are. Girth is the diameter of the tree. Height is the height of the tree. Volume is the volume. Girth is in inches. Height is in feet. And volume is in cubic feet, I believe. And this is this made up additional data set of whether the tree was in the sun or in the shade. So if we, so we'll use this data argument to tell the plot function that we're gonna be using in the tree data. And then all we have to do is put in the names of the columns that we want to plot. And we'll say height, and then we'll use this tilde symbol, which can be thought of as tilde equals is a function of, or more simply, you can just say whatever is on the left of the tilde tilde is the y variable. Or it's what will appear on the y axis. So here, Let's have tree height on the y-axis and let's do 
tree volume on the x-axis. And when we run this, we get a nice little plot of height on the y-axis, volume on the x-axis, a nice little simple scatter plot. We can also create a box plot if the x variable, in this case volume, is a categorical variable. So let's keep height there, but instead of volume, let's look at sun versus shade. I think we called that column light. If we run that, now we get a simple box plot with sun and shade and the box plots created around those values of height. The next most essential plotting function is the hist function or histogram function. There's so many times that you want to just quickly visualize what your data look like. How are they distributed? What kind of data are you working with? You just collected those data. You just came back from the field, entered them all. What's the first thing you're gonna look at? Gosh, do my data look reasonable? Are they crazy? Are there some crazy outliers out there? Let's take a quick look using the hist function. Let's just use tree data dollar sign height. Well, it's a capital H, I guess. Let's look at a distribution of tree heights in our data set. And there it is. Okay, finally, sometimes when we create plots, we also want to add lines to them. Let's take a look at this scatter plot that we had up here. Plot that one more time. Let's say that we want to add a line to this, a best fit line that shows the relationship between tree height and tree volume. Let's say it's a linear relationship for the sake of simplicity. Let's create a quick model. This kind of gets a little bit more advanced on the essential functions of our cheat sheet. We'll go back to this later, but let's create a simple model. We'll call it fitted model. And we'll use the LM function, which stands for linear model. And this actually takes the same syntax as the plot function. Height is a function of volume and the data are the tree data. This is going to be our fitted model. And then we're gonna plot these data. I'm just rearranging the order here. We're gonna plot this scatter plot. And then we're going to use the function AB line. Now remember with a linear model, you've got an A coefficient Efficient and a B coefficient. So for a linear model, going back to some basic algebra, Y equals A plus B X. That is the formula for a linear model. An A B line means give us an A, give us a B, and we will create a line for you. So the nice thing is that when we look at this fitted model, the fitted model returns these two coefficients, the intercept, which is the A, and the slope of the volume, which is B. So if we enter that fitted model right inside this AB line function, right after we plotted the data, we have this line that is thrown right on top. But sometimes you don't just want a nice fitted line, you want to mark certain thresholds in the data but using vertical or horizontal lines. To do that, still use the AB line function but we can use V for vertical equals, so let's say we want a vertical line at a volume of 40. So we'll say AB line V equals 40. And there we have a vertical line at volume equals 40, or maybe we'll do AB line H for horizontal at height equals 85. And there we have it. Now let's move on to working with data frames. I just created this little heading here. Didn't create it for the other sections. Doesn't matter. <laughs> let's just start working with data frames now. Uh, I'm never really sure if data frames should be one word or two words. Word and other applications always tell me that I spelled data frames wrong. Wow, look, if our studio is telling me that I spelled data frames wrong by having them together, then maybe it is really just data space frames. All right, so the most common function that I've used when working with data frames is just the names function. And what this does is it quickly allows us to see the names of all the columns in our data frame. So if we use our original data frame here, you can see that one column is called numvec, another is called species vec. If we use the names function for our tree data, 
we have girth volume, girth height volume, and light. And we can also use the names function to rename column headings. So for example, let's index out just the column of girth. So that's just the first value of name. So if we run that, we get just girth. And into that, we're going to rename it as dbh, which stands for diameter at breast height, which is a fancier way of saying girth and run that. And now we take a look at tree data again and the first column name has been renamed. And if we take a look at names for tree data one more time by just selecting that and running that alone, dbh height, volume, and light. I often use it for quickly looking at the names of a data frame when I'm trying to refer or index certain parts of a data frame and I just forgot what that column was called. Next, we have the data.frame function, which is what we use to create simple data frames when we have a bunch of vectors that we want to bring together into one data frame. And if you recall up here, that's what we did with the two vectors that we created when we started. NumVec, species vec, and then we use data.frame to combine these two vectors into one data frame. Now note that both of these vectors need to be the same length. With one exception, you can have vectors that are a length of one. So for example, let's create a new column and we'll call it my new column because I'm not original equals, let's just say my new column, we would just want the value of two inside my new column. Why not? When we run that and look at data frame, we have this new column of twos. And the reason that worked is because two in this case is one element, it's the same as a vector of just this one element, is evenly divisible into the number of rows here. So we get two divided into, I'm not making any sense. The point is that two is a length of one and you can easily fit the two into each. Okay, you know what? I can't explain this. Let me show you another example. Uh, if we had said one comma two, so now we have a vector of the value one and two, and run that, it will still work because now it will repeat the one and two throughout this entire data frame. However, if we had three values, one, two, and four, that won't evenly fit within the available space of this data frame and we'll get an error. Error in data frame, arguments imply differing number of rows. There it is. So it usually never have to do this, but just letting you know that that's an option. Maybe I shouldn't have told you. Next we have, actually speaking of telling people more than they need to know, I'm probably gonna remove data.frame from future cheat sheets, from the future versions of this Essentials of R cheat sheet, because there is a far superior way to make data frames in R, and those are called tibbles. So instead of data frame, data.frame, let's create our first my tibble. Again, very original. And here, instead of data frame, we're going to use the function tibble, which does the exact same thing that data.frame does, creating a data frame, except the data frame is now really cool and superior, and it's not called a data frame anymore, it's called a tibble, or maybe you call it a type of data frame, a tibble type of data frame, I don't know. Anyway, it stands for tidy table. When we run that, oh, we can't find the function tibble, and that's because we have to load up the package dplyr first to work with tibbles. When we run that, and again, you can install the package if you don't have dplyr first. It stands for data pliers. So remember you use pliers for bending and manipulating and changing things and wrangling things. And so that's what dplyr is, but for data. Now we should be able to run this and take a look at my tibble. And there it is. We have up here, it clearly tells us that it's a tibble. So thank you very much for that. It shows us that it is four rows long by two columns wide. It shows us the type of data that each of these columns comprises of. So here, numvec is a double or numeric column. Species vec is a character column and yeah, so it includes all of this neat information here. But actually the coolest thing about tibbles is not something we can see from this really simple data set. So let's create a tibble using our tree data.
my tree tibble. That's what I'll call it. Now taking a look at my tree tibble. Here's the really cool thing. Down here it says with 21 more rows. Now what's really nice about this is that if we had just looked at tree data not as a tibble, so the original version of tree data is not as a tibble, here are the data. Oh wait, what are the column names? Oh, we have to scroll up a bunch to get to here. Oh, okay. Wow, that's a lot of space. I don't wanna have to like open this all. Oh wait, what happened to, the oh, now I have to, how do I make, the oh, I have to, oh no. There we go, okay. Yeah, you get my point. Tibbles are really cool. There's a bunch of other advantages to them too, but for now, I'm just gonna say they're, they're a neat and simple way to look at and work with data frames. So now moving on to the next function, as.data.frame. Sometimes you end up working with matrices and that you want to convert to a data frame. So for example, here again, we have, we use the as.matrix to convert some kind of just going backwards now. We can take our original data frame, convert it to a matrix using as.matrix. Don't need to know that function. I'm just kind of showing you trying to create a matrix here to show you what I mean. So here we have this simple matrix of values. Usually you end up working with matrices when you're creating species by site matrices for uh, for multivariate ordinations in, in ecology and community, when you're dealing with community data and ecology and, and that kind of thing. So that's usually where, you're, where you'll encounter matrices the most. So let's say we have this matrix here and we want to convert it to a data frame, use as.dataframe with my matrix and there it is, back to a data frame. And along the same lines, we also have as underscore tibble. And the reason that most of the, so most of the functions that come with dplyr have kind of done away with using dots or periods to, to separate out words in functions and instead use underscores. And the reason for that is that if you're a Python programmer, the dots actually are read in a different way than they are in R, where in R they just kind of become part of the name of the function, whereas in, in Python they actually are an operator that indicate uh, something a little bit more than just part of the name of the function. And so for that reason to kind of simplify things and make them kind of universally understandable between the two languages, that's, that's my understanding. Maybe someone knows or understands a better reason for why why they've done away with the periods. So instead of as.tibble here, we have as underscore tibble for, for this function. And what this does is it actually does the same thing as as.dataframe, as.data.frame, but converts things into a tibble. So actually up here, we probably, sh instead of using tibble tree data, we really should have used as tibble because that can actually give you some errors. But if we use as tibble, oh, let's take a look at that. Here is our tree data tibble. Okay, now onto as.matrix. Oh, I guess I am gonna go over that. Yep, so I already did. As.matrix is useful when you want to create species by site matrices and some functions require that you that you uh, enter matrices into their arguments rather than, than data frames. And so that's what you would use as.matrix for. Again, here is the matrix of values based on this original data frame that we had. So with matrices, sometimes you need to swap them around. So swap what is in the column, make the columns into rows and make the rows into columns. And we can do that with the T function, or I think that stands for transpose. Let's see. T matrix transpose. Yes, okay, I was right. All right, so when we run this function on my matrix, here we have that same matrix, but the columns and rows have been reversed. Then we have the n call and the n row functions, which is just a quick useful way to get how many columns or rows we have in a data set. So let's look at our tree data n call. Looks like we have four columns in the tree data n row. Looks like we have 31 rows in the tree data. Simple as that, nothing more to it. So I did mention the tibble as being quite superior to the data frame because in what, well, one of the most useful things is that it 
nicely and neatly cuts off your data frames so that you can just see the top 10 entries, I guess. Um, you can also change what that value is. But either way, you see the top few entries instead of having to scroll through the whole data set. But another way to take a look at that using just a typical normal data frame is using the head function. And that just returns the top few entries of a data frame. So if we look at tree data and use head, I think the default is six, the top six rows. So here we see the top six rows of the tree data. The reason this isn't as great as using a tibble to begin with is it can be a little bit misleading if you didn't realize that you ran the head function because it doesn't tell you that there's more rows in this data frame that are missing. It's just a quick way to extract the top little bit of a data set. Okay, now I'm going to talk about one more function that I use tremendously. I love it, it's very useful. There's a lot of ways to use it. And that is the left join function. Now note there's also a right join and a few other types of joins which you can learn about by searching them here. But I'm just gonna talk about left join and then you can figure out the rest after that. So what this does is it is used to combine two data frames based on a reference column. And this again also uses the deep plier package. So make sure to install and load that library first. So let's say, let's, let's create two data frames so we can actually show how this works. Um, let's see, let's take a look at tree data. Let's, let's use it as a tibble. Let's use the my tree tibble. Since I keep talking about how great tibbles are. So we take a look at the tree data. Okay, let's add a column that indicates the, the identity of the tree. So which tree we're dealing with. We'll just do that by saying tree ID. And I think there's 31 rows total. Yeah, so here we have 10 rows with 21 more. So that's 31 rows. So into tree ID, we're just gonna say, add in the values of one through 31. And we'll make this as dot character, just so that the it's clear that these numbers don't mean anything as a number, but they're just the identity of each tree. So let's take a look at my tree tibble. So here we have this new column now called tree ID. Okay, and let's say we have, let's make a new data frame now, tree ID. 1 through 31, let's, let's create it with, with the tibble function. So tree ID is 1 through 31, and then let's see, let's make up some data. Tree leaves, let's just say we could count how many leaves each tree has, I don't know, I'm just making this up again. So let's just say tree leaves equals, let's, I'm gonna use a few extra functions here just to make this easy. So I'll actually, let's do run if, so that's picking a random number from a uniform distribution. And when we type that in, we get this little window that pops up that shows us what we can enter in it. And now I'm not getting that to pop up again. There we go. N is the number of values, min and max. So we'll say N equals 31, min equals 3000, max equals 5,000 leaves, let's say. And the problem is that these values, if we run just that, they're, they give us decimals as well. So let's just round that to whole numbers since let's just say we can only count entire leaves and not partial parts of leaves. So round, that should be enough. Run that, taking a look at this one more time. Yep, there we go, we have these 31 different leaf counts for these different trees. And we're adding that as column tree leaves. So now let's say that as my tree leaf data. Taking a look at this, we have this data set with the tree ID and the number of leaves for each tree. And then we have this other data set that has these other variables and tree ID, but doesn't have the leaf data. So we combine these together with the left join function. So typically the first data set that goes on the left is the one that has almost everything already in it. So here we'll put in my tree tibble. And then the next data set 
is the data set that contains the data we want to add to it, my tree leaf data. And then we add in one more argument that says by equals tree ID. This tells the function, let's take these data and then take these data and add them to these data and match it up so that every value in this data set is matched up to this data set based on a matching tree ID value. In this case, it's actually the same order because tree IDs are in the same order. So let's mix up that order actually to prove my point. So I'm just going to index this and I'm just going to sample 31 values from one through 31. That gives us a random order to everything. And let's save that into itself. So now if we take it tree leaf, we take a look at tree leaf data. Now all the tree IDs are all mixed up, but they're still associated with each particular number of tree leaves. So now if we do left join and let's save this as my data all. Now if we run left join, it should connect these two data sets by tree ID. Error can't join because of incompatible types. Ah, I know why. Because up here we saved it as dot character, but here we did not. So let's say as dot character. It's trying to combine numbers with letters and that doesn't work. Even though they're both numbers, one of them's a character. So it doesn't know what to do with that. Let's do that again. There we go, no error now. Let's take a look at my data all. And there it is. Now we have these tree leaves attached to this other data set. So if we let, let's take a look at tree ID one. Tree ID one is four, five, six, seven. Oh, that's convenient. That's easy to remember. Four, five, six, seven. Let's take a look at the original my tree leaf data. Oh, look, it's in the top 10. Number one is four, five, six, seven. And so it was able to successfully combine those two data sets. Now note that if we didn't include this by equals tree ID in here, R is pretty smart. When we run that, it shows us joining by equals tree ID because it found that that is the only column that's in common between the two data sets. If there wasn't a column in common between the two data sets, we'd get an error if we did that. All right, now let's get on to the basics of data wrangling. This is where it gets really fun and a little more advanced, but you can do some really cool things here. All of these functions are going to use the dplyr package. So if you haven't installed and run the library function for dplyr, do so now. And the first, first function we're gonna go over is the select function. And this is simply used for filtering and renaming columns that you want to keep or remove from a data frame. Going back to, let's use this new data set that we created, my, my data all. So the first argument of these functions is always the data set that you want to use. So in this case, we'll use the my data all that we created just now. If we take a look at this, We've got a bunch of different columns here, dbh, height, volume, light, tree ID, and the number of leaves in the tree. Um, so we can use select to select which columns we want to keep. Let's say we're only interested in dbh and height and tree ID. So we can just say dbh, height, tree ID. It's that simple when we run that function now we get a new data frame table that just consists of dbh, height, and tree ID. Now we could have also, let's say we wanted to keep everything, but we wanted to remove tree volume. So all we would have to do is put in a minus sign and then volume, just like that. And now we remove tree volume from this data frame. And let's say we want to rename some of the columns in this data frame. Let's say tree leaves is a little ambiguous and we want to rename it to leaf number, we can just say leaf number equals, and then that column was called tree leaves. Actually don't even need those parentheses, tree leaves. So now we only want to remove volume, but we want to keep everything else and rename leaf number equals tree leaves and run that. 
Now we have everything except for volume and leaf and tree leaves was renamed to leaf number. Now, if we only included leaf number equals tree leaves, that will only select the column tree leaves and remove everything else. Oops, just like that. So make sure that you include what you want to keep or what you want to remove and then what you want to rename. So that's what the select function does. Then we have the filter function. And what this does is if select is to filter out which columns you want to keep, the filter function is to filter out which rows you want to keep. So the first argument again is my data. And then it's simply a any kind of a statement that generates trues and falses based on the number of rows that you have. So we could say, let's take a look at all the data. We could say, say we want to keep all the trees that had a DBH greater or less than 11. We want to keep only these trees in our data set that are less than 11. So we'll create this true false statement and say, that's tree DBH. So we'll say, we want to keep everything where DBH equals, actually is less than 11. So when we run that, we're left with just those rows. And you can add multiple statements on here. So we could say, we want everything where DBH is less than 11 and height is greater than or equal to 70. So when we run that, now we have only those heights where the tree is greater than 70 and DBH is less than 11. And so note that every additional argument that you add onto the filter function with a comma is the same as saying and. So I want to filter for everything where this is true and this is true. If you want an either or, instead of a comma, you can just use this vertical line. I'm not sure what it's called. On my keyboard, it's right above the return key when I hold shift down. And what this says is I want to filter all my data where this is true or this is true. So when we do that, we get a whole lot more data. Next, we have the mutate function. And this is used to create new columns in your data frame or to modify existing ones. Again, all of these packages, all of these functions use the dplyr package. So once again, first argument is our data set. And let's say we want to, right now our height is measured in feet, but let's say we want to convert our height to meters. And so to do that, we have to multiply the height by 0 0.3048. That's just the conversion to convert it to meters. And so to create a new column in our data set, we can name it whatever we want. So in this case, height meters equals, and then we'll just say height times 0 0.3048. It's as simple as that. This new column that we want, we can name it whatever we want, equals height times whatever. So now if we take a look at our data, height in meters, we have it right here. And so if we wanted to add a few different new columns, we can just hit a comma and let's say we want to do height in, we'll just call it height modified and it'll be height times 0 0.05, whatever that means. We can also hit return here because R is not line or space sensitive for, for certain things like this to keep it a little bit more neat can hit return there. So then here we can clearly see what all the different columns that we're creating are. And if we run this, now we have two additional columns, height meters and height mod that have been added on. And you can also modify the existing ones. Like let's say, let's say we don't want to rename height, but we just want to modify it so that it's height in meters. I'm gonna remove this for simplicity. I'm just gonna call that height. So now what it's gonna do is it's gonna say, in this column height, we're going to take height and multiply it by that. But because height is the same name as the existing column, it will just replace the original values with these new ones. 
So now if we take a look under height, height has already been converted to meters in this case. Okay, moving on, we're going to use the summarize function. So this summarizes all the different columns in your data frame. If we put in the my data all again here, we have to enter in what summary values do we want. So for example, maybe we want to find out the mean height and we'll call that, and, and mean height will be based on the mean height. So applying the, applying the function mean, which I'll go over in a little bit, to the column height. And then let's say we also want to know the maximum girth or maximum dbh. And we'll use the function max, which we'll also go over in a bit later, but it's pretty self-explanatory. So now if we run this, we simply get this table with mean height and maximum dbh. Now you might wonder if you're just creating summary values for all the columns, why create a table? If there's only gonna be one row of these summary values of the, in this case, the mean height and the maximum dbh. And that's because summarize can be combined with the group by function, which is really neat. And the group by function allows us to split the data set into individual groups. So for example, let's say group by, let's group the data into whether the trees were in the sun or the shade. So we'll just use group by first arguments, the data again, and we'll just say we want to group by light. That's the name of that column. Oops. So if we run that, you'll notice nothing really changes. It's the same data set, but up here, we have this thing that says groups light, and the two tells us that there's two different groups. In this case, there was just shade or light or shade or sun or whatever it was. So on its own, it doesn't really do much, but then if we take this grouped data and put it inside of this summarize function, so I'm just gonna copy this over again. Copy that, and in place of my data all, I'm gonna put in this group by function. So now my data all has been grouped, and then we're putting it into this summarize function. And now take a look, and now we have one row for each of the different groups that we had grouped the data by. So now we have the mean height for shade trees, we have the mean height for sun trees, and the maximum dbh for shade trees and sun trees. And when you use the summarize function with the group by function, it actually automatically removes the grouping afterwards. So you'll notice here there's no remaining grouping in the data but sometimes it's useful to ungroup with the data to make sure that something doesn't go wrong down the line. So for example, we could have grouped by my data group. So I'm just saving this data set, this data frame as its own new data frame that's grouped. Oops, call that grouped. If we take a look at this, same data frame, but up here we've got this indication that it's grouped by light. And then we can put that into summarize and run that. And so here is the data set, or the summary of that data set based on light. But then we might want to do something else with these data and we want to ungroup them because they're still grouped. So we'll put them in this ungroup. And when you run that, oops. It's the same data set again, but you'll notice the grouping variables have disappeared. And you can also use the group by function with the filter and mutate. So for example, if you want to filter for all, if you want to remove or, or extract only the tallest trees from the sun group and the shade group, if you just used max height, so which height equals max height in this filter, you'd only get one tree value because it's the maximum, the tree with the tallest height out of the whole data set. But if you group the data first based on light and applied this filter, it would actually extract 
it would extract the tallest tree from each of the groups that you had grouped by. So the group by function can be really, really useful. All right, we are almost done. And actually we've covered most of the functions in this last section on basic statistics, but I'll quickly go over them one more time. We've got the LM or linear model function. This is the most basic function for doing any kind of statistical analysis in R. It allows you to do everything from t-tests to ANOVA, regression, multiple regression, etc. They all fall in that same category of simple linear models. And so a simple way, a simple example of this would be, let's do a linear model of dbh is a function of, so remember this tilde indicates is a function of, or the y variable, what's left on the left of it is the y variable and on the right of it are the x variables. So let's say we want to model dbh as a function of light, so the sunlight, and what else do we have to work with? As a function of sunlight and the number of leaves. So remember leaves were just random, we just created this random data set. So tree leaves shouldn't actually really be an important predictor of dbh, but let's just see what happens. So a, simp a simple model would be just how is dbh a function of light? And then, the, and then we add the data in here, my data all. So this would be the simplest way to do, to do this. And since light is two different categories, you can kind of think of this as a t-test. Is there a difference in dbh between these two different variables? And we'll save this as mod one. And so if we take a look at mod one, it doesn't really give us much to work with. It just gives us the estimate for the coefficients in this model. But the summary function, not to be confused with the summarize function from before, just summary, will give us a more detailed summary of these model results. So here we have the model formula, the residuals, the coefficients, and then the p-value, whether, whether the intercept and the slope, in this case the effect of light, is significant, and a few other test statistics and information. And you should check out my other video on doing basic linear regression in R if you're interested in learning more about how this works. I'm not gonna go over the details now, just want to show you how to use this function. Now, we could have also added in some more variables. So for example, we'll add in, so let's say we think tree leaves are also a predictor of dbh. It might actually be the other way around. But either way, let's run that and now take a look at the summary. And we have the same results as before with sunlight appearing to be significant, but then tree leaves does, do not have a significant effect or association with DBH in this case. Now there's a lot of assumptions to this because it's a linear model, but again, I'm not going over any of the stats here, just wanted to show you how this works. Then we have the mean function, which we've gone over already. I think I used it a bunch of times. It just calculates the mean value uh, from, a, from a vector. So if we use numvec here, the mean value of numvec is, happens to be five. And if we have an NA value, we can't actually calculate the mean because it will just give us an NA. So remember, you can also use na.rm or na.remove equals true and then it will calculate the mean after removing the NA. Then we have max and min. Let's use, let's actually use our data here. So let's see what the maximum height is. 87 feet. Let's see the, and then we have the minimum. The minimum tree height is 63 feet and so on. Then we also have median, which is different from mean because it gives us the value where 50% of the data are below that value and the other 50% are above that value in the data set. So our median value in this case with tree heights is 76. If we did our mean value, it might be close to the median, but there are cases where the median is more important or more 
informative than the mean and vice versa. But let's just out of curiosity's sake, let's see what the mean value of tree heights is. It's also 76. All right, well, that makes sense. Given enough data that fall under a normal distribution, the mean and median should be the same thing. And finally, last but not least, the function that I think is quite underrated, very few people ever mention it, but I just love this function because it's a really quick way to get a nice summary of any categorical variables that you have in your data, and that is the table function. So in our data set here that we've been working with, let's say we want to get a quick summary of how many trees were in the shade and how many trees were in the sun. We'll just apply this table function with my data all to light and we have this quick output that shows us 15 trees were in the shade and 16 trees were in the sun and if you have a more complex categorical variable such as maybe you have a column for different species and you're dealing with hundreds of different species maybe even just tens of different species but you have a huge data set and you just want to see how many data points do you have available for each species then you would run that and you get this nice little table of the different species names and how many individual observations you have for each. So that is it. That concludes the functions that I covered in my essential functions of R cheat sheet. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Uh, if you did, make sure to click the like button down below. It really helps me be able to share my videos as much as I can, get them out there, get as many people to see them as possible. Um, be sure to subscribe if you want to get more updates whenever I post new videos. Uh, and again, if you really like this and want to kind of take it a, a step further, be sure to check out my course on the basics of R for Ecologists. There is a link down below in the description. Uh, and you can subscribe right there to find out when the next course enrollment opens up. So with that, I hope you have a great rest of your day and see you next time.